Hey everyone, it's Andy with AdjustableAudio.com and this time I'm going to have a think about using uh, analog emulation plugins for in-the-box mixing to recreate the, um, the sort of tape to console signal chain. First of all, I'm going to take a look at what we would do, how we would actually use the plugins to recreate the exact sort of path that we go through with a uh, microphone to a preamp onto tape through a mixing console, um, mixing and then actually producing a, a half inch master, two track master at the end of it. And then have a quick think about some of the variations that we get with freedom that we get because we're working in the digital domain. So this is the project that I'm going to be working on. It's not a particularly large one. I've got a bunch of drum parts there and a few other bits and pieces docked about. I've got a few group tracks set up. And if we have a quick look at what the mix console looks like for that, thank you. Right. You can see here I've got all my separate parts that I'm going to be mixing. These are my group tracks and that's my, my stereo out sitting over there. So within the concept of this being an analog session, you've got your recordings already made and you are the mix engineer. You get a box that's full of tape and all of your source tracks are going to come off that two inch, let's say 16 or 24, whatever it is, track tape. So the first thing that in recreating this situation we're going to want to do is this. Um, I'm just going to select all my tracks so I can do all of these at once. And then I'm going to do an insert and I'm going to put in on the first slot my insert, my virtual tape machine. Um, I use Slate stuff. There are plenty of other manufacturers and some freeware companies who do great emulations as well. Uh, this happens to be the one that I chose. So so first off then I've got across all my actual source tracks the tape machine. So that's my my reel of tape loaded up onto my uh, onto my tape drive and that's giving me the lovely warm silky tape sound that we we all believe we want so much of the time that tape machine is then plumbed into a mixing desk so the next thing that i'm going to hit is all the tubes and transistors and what have you of the the actual console so the next thing i'm going to install down here is my console emulation and where are we so my virtual channels give those a opportunity to load up for a moment right so off tape into my uh console and then just picking the first track that i've got down there i've then got anything else that i might want to do so i might want to put a um a compressor on that and i might want to do a bit of basic sort of eqing and then the output from my individual channels is going now in my case and if you can see here let me just make these a little bit bigger so my output is actually going out to a drum bus and i use this so that i can add effects and change levels of, of all my drum kit at once so in keeping with the model um if i am routing from my desk console channel out into a bus i am going to put on here an instance of my virtual mix bus which is very similar to my channel except that i've got left and right tracks and you know a little bit of cross talk a little bit of distortion between those so i do that on any of my mix buses that have got um signal going out to them and then the outputs from those mix buses and from any tracks I've got which don't go to mix buses is going out to my stereo output track. On my stereo output track I'm again going through a mix bus so stick another mix bus on there and then finally going out to be written to typically it's going to be two track half inch tape so again just keeping with the model for the moment i'm going to put a tape machine out there now looking at some of the settings that we've uh, got on some of these as i said earlier the thing about working in the digital domain is that you have this absolutely amazing amount of freedom um, if i open up and just have a quick look at the kind of settings we've got here Obviously, this is specific to the um, 
the slate machine that I'm using, but you're going to have something vaguely similar, some kind of maybe slight variation, but similar kind of setups on anything that you go with. And the first thing that I'm going to want to do is to say, right, in keeping with emulation, I'm saying that this is my two inch 16 track. I'm going to opt for the 456 formulation because it's a little bit funkier than the EFG9. I quite like 15 inches per second. Don't get me wrong, I'm just doing these to sort of illustrate the point. I would give the tracks a listen through, see what I like the sound of best. And then I would set my kind of dry levels. And just to get an idea of what we're doing, think about this for a moment while I um, just find the right place to do something in this project. Back in the day when tape machines and analog consoles was the only thing that we had to mix with. The engineers who built these things would do their damnedest to make them as crystal clear and clean in operation as possible. The irony being that in the day, if they could have made a tape machine that had no wow flutter, no tape compression, no anything like that, they would have done it quite happily. Now that we've got all those things in the digital, digital domain, we're anxiously trying to get back to the um, the good old days. And as a result of that, one of the things that we sometimes tend to do is overcook it a bit. So if I just kick off um, to play through here, watch this. Now, I can see my needle banging against the stops, the red lights on it. I'm really getting my money's without this plug-in as it sits here. And if I was simply doing this on my, what am I, on my kick drum, um, that might sound pretty good. But of course, I'm actually doing it on my snare and my hi-hat and my toms and my claps and my bass, my guitars, my vocals, on everything else. And then I'm putting it through another layer of distortion. Oh, look, in my virtual channel, let's turn the drive and the input all the way up on that and really get that thing moving as well and then on my console i'm going to bang it up against the stops on there and then on my two bus and then on my two bus um tape machine now here i'm going with my half inch two truck output and set it as it will but you know really get this thing banging up there and doing something I am getting loads of analog warmth and more is better. The trouble is if I do this, what I'm probably gonna end up with is a right old muddy mess at the end of the day. Now, the reason that I bang on about that is quite simply this. On this particular project, we have emulated fairly rigorously exactly what's gonna happen when you are working in the analog domain. But of course you can do anything that you want. You can put two or three of these virtual tape machines in there. You can put them the other way around. You can stack, do anything that you like with them. Um, if you are trying to hear the difference between a tape machine going into a console or a console into a tape machine or a tape machine into a console into a mix bus into another mix bus and you're doing it with one or two tracks and you are trying to hear what's going on your tendency is to max everything out so you can really hear it people sometimes say i've done this and it just ends up making everything sound wrong that's because back in the day the stuff that we're actually trying to copy nobody had settings like this you know the kind of settings that people were using there were aimed at keeping signals within the the linear part of the operation of the machinery and if we set everything up like this so that it's giving a, a nice sort of subtle shimmer onto the onto the audio it's really hard to hear the effects of moving things about and you know i spent a couple of happy evenings playing around with this and came to the conclusion that i didn't have a clue which was better i'm sure i managed to kid myself a few times about various things so what i do now is i generally use these things in the sense of let's recreate the signal path as it existed back in the good old analog days um, even then it can sometimes get to be a bit too much so if you want to clean things up a little bit your, your first put of call is going to be these lower the levels going through your individual plugins you know let's try and keep these at a reasonable sort of level it can sometimes end up being a bit too much to go tape to channel to mix bus to mix bus so it's possible that you might want to think about losing some of either the mix buses or losing some of the individual channels that i've got set up feeding into them 
you've got to be a bit cautious with some of this stuff because what you can sometimes find happening is see up here my uh, audio processing load now you've you kind of got to understand what these things are showing you because you can start panicking a bit otherwise but even with just that little look running across a relatively compact project i'm using quite a lot of cpu and if you don't have a powerful enough computer or if you've got a big project you can end up really kind of sucking dry your processing power a couple of things to note certainly using cubase if you have your processing on the individual audio tracks you get the freeze channel function and what that does is it effectively renders it, it takes your plugins offline and renders the sound of them available so that reduces the plugin load you can't do that on your group tracks but then again on the group tracks if you've got one set of plugins on a group track you can save a set on every one of your audio channels there so you've got to be a little bit pragmatic you've got to be a little bit practical um, in deciding where you're going to use these things a neat little trick to remember is if you are really rigorously sticking with the concept of tape into console recording if you were running 16 or 24 track and you didn't have enough tracks to record everything well you couldn't simply add another one you'd run out of tracks and the sort of thing that you might do is you might have taken your backing vocals um, got the level set, got the singers set up around a mic or microphones, and then actually recorded this little down onto one track. So it's quite in keeping with that image to say, let's remove this processing from each of the individual backing vocal tracks, but apply it onto the bus. And although you clearly wouldn't have tape on a bus, if you were sticking with the mental picture here, it's quite reasonable to say, let's say that I've just stuck all my backing vocals onto one track on the tape. So I've got one lot of tape distortion going into one console emulation, replacing six plugins across the way there. So even within keeping the, the kind of image going, you can um, you can make this fairly fairly rigorous, but save yourself a bit of processing power along the way. Your outputs I don't always have tape emulation on the output, depends what the effect is that I'm trying to get. But if I do, it's just worthy of a very quick thought about where it goes. So keeping this model in mind, you come through your through your console and then you may want to put any dynamics, anything like that on there. So let's say once again that I just wanted to put a compressor on there. A bit of subtle EQ moving just to make it sound properly mastered and then i'm going to hit my tape machine which will remember i've got set up to be my half inch two track emulation on the way out at this point we kind of have to admit that we're now really working in the digital domain you notice that this is not in the last slot it's actually in the last but two in my case that's because in cubase these two final insert slots seven and eight are actually post fader and these are where i would typically want to put if I'm using dither to reduce word length, I would typically want to put my dither in there. And if I'm using brick wall limiter to squash the hell out of it, or I mean to give it just a little bit more overall level, um, that's not distortion at all, it's dynamics I want. My brick wall limiter is going to go in those last couple of slots there. So we kind of step out of the emulated world at this point and get back into the realities of digital recording. Obviously, the, the bottom line truth of all of this is that. It's your project, they're your plugins, you do absolutely anything that you want with it, but you can waste an awful lot of time just trying to figure out how to make the best out of these. If you want to run with a strict analog simulation, that's the way to do it. And if you then find that you've either got too much of a good thing or that you need to save a little bit of computer power, you've got some ideas there for how and where to save it whilst keeping the logic of it flowing. So I'm Andy, this is the dustbowlaudio.com. And I will catch up with you next time out. So take care. See you then. Bye.